to say something. Go ahead. Um, I'm innocent. You all, you're garbage. That's all your honor. Miss Fowler, I you know, don't know that that's appropriate here. Um, Sorry, I told you what somebody else can. Okay, thank you everyone for your hard work in this case. <clears throat> Hey, what's up, it's Mel. Welcome back to the channel. Thank you for stopping by. We're going to be talking about Julissa Thalmer, a mother that had shot her son, Eli Hart, with a shotgun nine times. We're going to get into the whole custody situation because she had just gotten full custody. Ten days before Eli's death is when the mother got full custody. The father had been complaining about mental health and drug abuse and allegedly was ignored by the courts. He's actually doing a lawsuit. We'll talk more about that. And then... So it was six days prior to the murder that uh, he actually filed for custody himself. I'm also going to briefly talk about some other cases where mothers had killed their children and a little bit of a mental health talk. And I'm just kind of curious, want to bounce off of you guys to know what you think. So make sure you check out my sponsor, Data Seal, a service that I use to scrub my information off the internet to stop people from trying to find my address, phone numbers, et cetera, family, friends. Use the link, save 5% off, and check out the free scan. Your information is being sold by data brokers all the time. It's easy for anybody to look up your information using people search websites. They can find your home address, date of birth, email address, phone number. Dataseal.io is the data removal and monitoring service I trust to remove my information from the internet. Click the link below and use the code five off all to save 5% off your data seal subscription. Eli murdered by his own mom. Why would she kill Eli? If she didn't want him, she should have given him to Tori. Nikita blames herself for what happened. Jalissa Thaller shooting the child nine times with a shotgun amid a contentious custody dispute with Eli's dad, Tori Hart. It's reported that she bought the shotgun six days after her son's father, Tori Hart, filed for custody. So Eli was sat in a booster seat in the back seat of Thaler's gray Chevy Impala when she fired nine times into his body, reloading the weapon between rounds. The onslaught of violence left his remains badly mutilated with the crime one of the worst local cops and prosecutors have ever seen. Fowler was later pulled over by cops after a concerned eyewitness reported seeing her badly damaged car near a dumpster. Officers noticed the back window of her sedan was smashed and that one of its wheels were totally destroyed, supposedly was riding on rims. They found Eli's remains in the trunk, as well as a firearm used to kill him. Thalmer was also discovered to have dumped some of her son's body parts in a nearby dumpster. Chilling still images taken from security camera showed Thalmer and Eli leaving her apartment on the morning of his death. Thalmer was later snapped wearing the same outfit while chatting to cops after being pulled over following the murder of her son. Jurors just took two hours to convict her of first degree murder. This incident was May 19, 2022. And so when she was stopped, it was like a traffic stop because there was reports of her driving without a tire on the rim. When police pulled her over, she had blood on her and pieces of flesh, reportedly. And her account to police, what she told them is that she got this blood from changing a tampon. And then also that the pieces of flesh was from a deer that she had picked up at the butcher. It was reported that after 30 minutes, police actually drove her home. And when they drove her home, that's when it was discovered that Eli was in the trunk and also the shotgun was there as well. Body was found in the trunk of a car after a traffic stop there. Throughout the day, authorities investigated four different scenes across the area, including the parking lot of a gas station and an abandoned house. Documents also reveal a long custody battle between her and Tori Hurt, Eli's father. No matter how many cries we cried, they ignored us, no matter how many warning signs there were. Tori's fiance, Josie, tells Fox 9 the boy's mother struggled with drug addiction and mental health issues, and that Eli was in and out of foster care for years. Despite their repeated cries for help, his mom was recently awarded full custody. Josie says the system completely failed Eli. That was it until last night when we got notified that he was found in his mom's trunk of her car. Not only did we express concerns to social services multiple, multiple times, and every time the response was, this is something for family courts. The laws do not allow us to address this unless we see physical abuse 
we have no grounds to remove him from our home. So keep some of those things in mind, like the CPS, the history of reporting all these incidents, mental health, substance abuse. Um, and because we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. I wanted to show you this as well. Well, Thaler had only recently gotten oh, her son sorry. back. <laughs> For more than a year, Dakota County Social sorry. Services had custody of Eli. But despite even their concerns, including about Thaler's mental health, he was returned to her. Jennifer Hoff is digging into how exactly that happened. Julie, it may boil down to two things here. Officials reported that they didn't have concerns for Eli's physical well-being while in his mother's care, and his father had recently filed for custody. But in order for that to move forward, experts tell us the county case to protect that little boy had to be closed first. Which, the day that she purchased the gun, I don't know if I said this already, at some point in recording I said this, the day she purchased that shotgun was the day he filed for custody. Taylor is charged with killing her son, Eli Hart, last week, but documents show she'd been filing abuse reports against Eli's father, Tori, since 2016 when she was pregnant. He's never been criminally charged, and Thaler at one point admitted her mental health issues cause her to accuse Hart of things that he doesn't do. The mental health thing. So she's over here falsely accusing him. I can't even tell you how many times we expressed our concerns our fears. Hart's fiance says he recently filed for custody of Eli. That was a little over a year after court records show Dakota County took the boy into custody. Documents also show Thaler was hospitalized then and was hearing voices. Damn, bro. And so this is all going to come into play too with a conversation that we're going to bring up later uh, with the other cases of these women that um, they had some sort of psychosis and, you know, there's a huge thing of support for these women, the um, Lindsay, I, I guess Andrea too, I'm not sure about you. I, and I haven't dug into those cases, but you know, the conversation we're going to have, and you guys can start thinking about that. Should this woman get quote unquote pass? And there's different meanings to that. Not saying that, I mean, like it seems like society has given this woman, Lindsay, a pass, you know, a huge amount of support. She's getting all these letters this Lindsay's, and we'll talk about it later, is a woman that killed her three kids and tried to kill herself. Uh, the GoFundMe is at a million dollars, which they're saying it's not going to be for legal funds, but like uh, an amount of support. And so should these people that are killing their kids, if they have mental health, are they just going to let this, you know, just let it go or just put them in that mental health facility? Thaler was hospitalized then and was hearing voices telling her to... So, I mean, you got here a report that mother presenting with psychosis, hearing voices to kill herself, paranoid delusions, transport hold and admitted to hospital. Voices telling her to kill herself. While Eli was in foster care, social workers continued to document red flags about Thaler, including that she stopped seeing her therapist, had unstable housing and was charged for stealing drugs. Despite that, social services and a court guardian recently recommended a judge give her full custody, which in turn. That's pretty wild. But because when I was thinking, I'm hearing about the story and I think about the other stories as well. Um, and people tend to get really upset with CPS. If there's, if, if those are the same people in that same category that are very forgiving and you know, let's, let's get some help for these people. I don't think you can condemn CPS because CPS are, are just people too. And so maybe those are the same types of people that are like, you know, okay, we're going to give this mom another chance. We're going to give her a second chance or third chance and all that kind of stuff and chance and chance and chance, even though they're supposed to be there for, for preventative measures. Maybe these are the same types of people that have that, you know, um, feeling about these types of situations and they're trying to give them chances. Allowed officials to close the protection case and for Eli's father to fight for custody in family court. On May 10th, they returned custody and closed the county case in Dakota County. And 10 days later, we got the news that Eli was found dead. Well, and I feel like, too, when it comes to, like, mothers and women, the system just gives all this kind of, like, passes. Um, just kind of like, you know, I have mixed feelings about this Lindsay stuff and all that, but I'm, I'm not like, oh, I, if I was the father, I just couldn't see. I'm not in that situation, but I couldn't see myself. being. I forgive you and just, okay, cool. We're here to support. I couldn't. I would be. I just couldn't imagine what I would be like. Uh, but it wouldn't be like that. I can tell you. But there's a lot of people that you know they really do like sympathize so much so that almost sometimes it feels like they sympathize more with the person that's killed the kids than the actual kids themselves that are dead. 
But I, I almost wonder too, can that leniency be problematic? Because these people in CPS, they do the, these, isn't it like reunification? They do these things, these programs where they'll try to give people, and some people really do clean themselves up and some people really do get help and all this stuff. And some people can't, or I don't know, it's a lifelong issue thing. But maybe these people are just trying to, like the same people trying to give uh, parents, mothers really, because it doesn't seem like dads really ever get a chance, mothers uh, giving them like a chance to try to like fix their life and be reunited with their kids and so their kid could actually be with a mother. But then you have a lot of these situations happening. And so, um, I don't know. While there are still a lot of questions, experts say child protection cases take precedence over any other kind of case in the state, from a divorce to a name change. Minnesota law says is that the juvenile protection matter needs to go forward and be resolved first before those other types of cases that may involve the child. The goals, too, of the child protection system are really different than the goals of family court. So I want to take a look at some of the web searches that they showed and Remember, the incident took place May 19, 2022. And so search terms here from her MacBook Air, it says, and this was December 5th, 2021, how to keep child from other parent with visitation. And then on 12 9, 2021, how to fake AM insurance claim car damage, how to fake car insurance claim. Uh, 12 17, how much blood can a six year old lose? Okay, and this is in 2021, so she's been thinking about this for a while, it seems like. All right, and now in December 28th, 2021, does a doctor's note prevent child from visiting other parents? So she's looking and plotting to not let this guy see this kid at all. Most powerful knockout drug, how much whiskey to give a baby? Okay, now on January 17, 2022, payment from life insurance if child dies, most expensive life insurance for child. How much does life insurance pay for child, for dead child? Now, January 25th, 2022, how to fake being home to cops, to the cops. Okay, so she did, maybe if they come to the house, she don't want to have to answer. Another one, January 25th, 2022, how to keep child from school for a month. Then January 29th, 2022, child life insurance policy, best whole life insurance policy for child. January 30th, 2022, Qualifying accidental deaths. So she's looking how to kill this kid. February 3rd, 2022. Does life insurance cover drowning? Student loans for six year old kids. I can't read the rest here. Commit crime to blame child. Sign up with child's social security number. What length am I allowed to saw off shotgun barrel? That was 5 16, 2022. So there's a couple of things that I found and thought were interesting that we're going to take a look at. We'll start out with this. Um, and like I, I've kind of already covered this, but. Just to kind of highlight it again, it's just kind of wild to think about it. It says a newly filed search warrant is raising questions as to why the mother of six-year-old Ellie Hart was allowed to go home after a traffic stop that eventually led to the discovery of the boy's body in the trunk of her car. Julissa Thaller was pulled over after driving on her rim and with a window smashed out. And new documents filed in connection with the murder investigation. Urono police officers said they saw what appeared to be blood on her hands face and clothing they also saw a bullet a bullet hole and spent shell casings police wrote that dollar told police officers the blood was from the removal of a tampon bro then they i guess they believed that and that the suspected body tissue in the car was from deer meat she recently picked up from the butcher after 30 minutes julissa was given a ride home by police yeah we'll take you home it was after that when six-year-old ellie's body was found in the trunk dollar was later arrested after seen walking Ms. Thaler, you have a right to speak this morning if you'd like. You don't have any obligation to speak, but if you'd like to choose to speak, now is the time to do it. Yes, I would like to say something. Go ahead. Um, I'm innocent. All your garbage. That's all your honor. Ms. Thaler, I you know, don't know that that's appropriate here. Um, Sorry, I told you what somebody else can. What I would say is... Mm. And if you say the... Uh, Attorney's reaction. She's like, sorry, I told you what somebody else can't. And she also ends up flicking off, flicking them off. Oh, look at her face. Oof. Sorry, you know, don't know that that's appropriate here. Um, sorry, I told you what somebody else can't. What I would say is, you know, the worst thing that seems to happen to parents is to lose their child. 
it's worse though when you don't lose your child to something like cancer or an accident. It's when someone takes that child from the world. What I can't imagine, nobody can imagine, is when the person that takes a child from the world is the one that brought that child in. But that is what the jury concluded he did, and I respect the jury's judgment, and I respect Minnesota's decision about what the appropriate consequence is. Nothing so she's still claiming to be innocent, I guess. She believes she's innocent, she didn't do it. And I think some, sometimes to their situations, where there's just some people, parents, some vile parents, whether it's mother or father, a lot of times you hear mother, but you hear fathers doing it too, where they just really don't want the other parent having the child at any cost and just really vindictive, you know, to the very end. Nothing I do would bring justice to this situation. Nothing I do would relieve any of the pain that you cause by doing that. But what is, according to law, the just and fair sentence for what you did, is what Mr. Allard said, and that is life in prison without the possibility of parole. So I will judge you guilty of first degree murder and issue that sentence. I will not um, impose any sentence. I can't hear you over your stomach grumbling. I'm sorry. Bottom line is. Oh shit, she says she can't hear him over his stomach grumbling or, or hers. I first degree murder and issue that sentence. I will not. I can't hear you over your stomach. Oh, sorry. His stomach, I think. The bottom line is that you are being sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole and installing. You're not going to impose any kind of fine or fees. I will require that you submit a DNA sample. As I mentioned, I'll keep restitution open for 60 days. There's a tag misdemeanor case. I'm going to dismiss that in the interest of justice. With that, is there anything else, Mr. Allen, we can cover this morning? No, Your Honor, thank you. Ms. Rapp, I have to give you the opportunity as well. Anything else? No, thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Leary? Nothing, Your Honor. Ms. Newton? Nothing, Your Honor. Okay, thank you everyone for your hard work in this case. <coughs> mm. She pulled that, uh, that buster finger out. That slick slide buster finger. I also wanted to show you this snippet from uh, the former boyfriend of Julissa testifying and he engaged with Eli. He was at the house and just check out what he had to say. In heartbreaking testimony today, Robert Pickerainen filled in gaps for the jury about what happened leading up to those images and what happened when Eli's mother, Julissa Thaler, returned to the apartment the next morning. Pickerainen testified while choking on tears that he and Eli were playing with kittens in Thaler's apartment at 11 p.m. on a school night when Eli started to get rowdy. Mom didn't like that, so she started hitting him, Pickerainen uh. testified. He then told the jury that as he went to bed, Thaler brought her shotgun down to the car, came back and grabbed Eli and left. He woke up the next morning by Thaler doing laundry right after her first interaction with police. Pickerainen said he assumed Eli was at school. I said, where did you go? She was kind of like, I had to go do something. Prosecutors say mm. after leaving the apartment, Thaler shot Eli nine times with her shotgun. The defense so far has not suggested an alternative theory other than that Thaler didn't do it. When questioning Pickerainen, they pointed out that he told police he didn't think Thaler could hurt Eli. She's sweet. I didn't think so, no. She was a very sweet person, he testified. I wanted to share this as well, and this is Eli Hart's dad and stepmother speaking at the sentencing. <laughs> Take your time. You can get some water for you too. I'll be okay. <laughs> it's just so, so much. <clears throat> and she's right there. I think dad's going to come up now. Ask you the same question that I asked before, and that is, would you prefer that this, would you allow it to be recorded, um, or would you rather not be recorded? Whatever you wish is what we'll respect. Uh, I allow it. Allow it, okay. All right. With that, I'll turn it to the two of you, however you'd like to present it. 
Your Honor, everyone knows Eli Hart as the victim of this senseless and horrific crime. But Eli was so much more. Eli was an amazing six-year-old boy who always woke up full of energy and laughter. He was kind, made friends easily, loved reading books. Eli had a love for animals that was very special. Eli explored, played outside, fished with his dad. Eli was an innocent, loving six-year-old boy. He did not deserve this. Eli deserved to grow up and have a safe and happy life. We know these things about Eli because he was our little boy, our son, the center of our world. The love and connection he had with his son, that Tori had with his only son, was something I was privileged to see. You could see the love and bond they shared every second they were together. They had this extra spark between them that everyone could see. Now we only have memories. And they're not enough. Time was taken from us, a lifetime of memories to be made gone. The moment, moments I treasured as being a parent myself, Tori will never have those experiences. A lifetime without Eli robbed of us. School milestones that we will never get to see like graduating kindergarten and elementary school all the artwork he would have brought home and put on the fridge, taken. The first day of middle school and high school, prom, graduation, watch him play sports, teach him to drive, stolen from us. Watching Eli grow and become a young man and what he could have been and done in this world. We will never have those memories. No more hugs, no more snuggles. They were ripped from us straight from our souls on May 20th, 2022 at about 11.30 p.m. when an officer knocked on our door and asked to come in, then asking Tori to have a seat. The cries from my husband broke my heart in a million pieces and then listening to the officer tell me what happened broke it into a million more. Watching my husband sob as his brother tried to comfort him watching the officer's hands shake while he tried to write down his number on a small piece of paper was the moment I knew our lives had shifted forever, that nothing would ever be the same, the pain will never go away, this will forever affect our day-to-day -day lives. You can't explain the loss of your only son. You can't explain what that does to you or anyone. Then. Having lost him in such a horrific way, you just can't explain how that changes your life. How the pain is so deep you can't breathe. How nothing in your life looks or feels the same. And no one understands. Your lack of sleep at night, the nightmares of how Eli was murdered. The struggle to go to work every day knowing Eli has no more days. How painful it is that life just keeps moving and doesn't slow down for us to grieve. No one should ever have to feel this kind of pain or experience, this kind of trauma. But we have been sentenced to a lifetime of this pain, confusion, grief, sorrow, and trauma. A lifetime without Eli. The little boy who would laugh and giggle and squeal so hard when he and his dad would play at the park. It's a sound I hope never fades from our memory. The little boy who rescued a panfish that was stuck on shore when he was fishing with his dad. Um, the little boy who rescued the... Okay, just a second, I'm sorry. The little boy who rescued 
a baby panfish who was stuck in the shore when he was fishing with his dad. He was so proud. He came running in to tell me all about it, but couldn't get his words out because he was so excited. He was so proud. The little boy who would tell me not to be scared of bees, that they were nice and we need them. The little boy that loved being on his dad's shoulders. The little boy who, when we asked him, who loves you the most, would always reply, you both do. There are no more triple hugs, no more I love you, no more memories to be made, just emptiness. You were the happy six-year-old boy, our little boy, that we loved so deeply. Thank you. I'm told a couple things for you. When you were testifying over there about how Eli was everything to you, everyone in the courtroom felt your pain. And I went home that night, and you know things happened. Picture pops up, it's me and my son. He's about six years old, missing some teeth. And he, like he, uh, and he meant everything to me too. And as I looked at that picture, I understood better that you're living out the nightmare of every parent, the worst nightmare of every parent. There's a different difference between us though, Tori. Um, I couldn't do what you did. Um, I couldn't, if I lost my son, I couldn't summon the strength to do probably anything meaningful again, let alone come into this environment and tell the world the story of how the most important thing in the world is taken from you. Um, I commend you for that. And what I hope is that the strength you showed by coming in here will be the strength that will eventually help you make peace with the fact that you know that it's going to take a while to realize that the overwhelming joy that Eli brought to you in the six years that he was with you outweighs and it's going to outlast that overwhelming pain that you've just described in losing him way to a little bit. So I wish you the best of luck in your journey and I appreciate and respect what you've gone through and the dignity you've shown going through. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you too. So I want to get into the GoFundMe here because this gives a little bit of backstory from their account. And um, so far it's at 45,000. It says here for the funeral and a headstone. It says, hi, my name is Nikita. I'm creating this GoFundMe for Tori. He is the father of Eli who was tragically killed and was located by the Orono police on Friday, May 20th, 2022 in the trunk of his mother's vehicle due to several false orders of protection filed by Eli's mother. Tori could not have a relationship with Eli. In January 2021, Eli was placed in foster. Eli spent 11 months living in my home at the time. During that time, Eli and Tori were able to start a relationship, and their bond was powerful from the start. Eli fell in love with his father and loved spending time with him. Tori was excited to make up for all the lost years and was thrilled to start teaching his son how to fish and ride a bike with no training wheels. At the end of December 2021, Eli returned to his mother's house for a home trial. Due to many red flags Eli's mother was showing, Tori tried extremely hard to get custody of Eli. Unfortunately, more false orders of protection were filed, which postponed custody hearings. Numerous parties made many statements to CPS, fearing that mom would harm Eli if full custody was returned. Sadly, full custody was, was returned May 10th, 2022. Here's some pictures of them together. We now need to plan a funeral for a child to be laid to rest. Many parents don't intend to bury their child, so we are unsure how much a funeral home and headstone will cost. These donations will cover the cost of the funeral and headstone for the sweet angel and cover any wage loss as Tori grieves the loss of his son. So with Lindsay Clancy and just a, a brief um, touch on the timeline of January 24th, and this is from um, this is an abridged timeline from law enforcement and prosecutors. On that morning, Lindsay takes her five-year-old daughter, Cora, to a doctor's appointment. When they return home, they play outside in the snow with three-year-old Dawson and Clancy and sends pictures of the children to her mother and husband. And it was said that there was nothing out of the ordinary from that. 4.02 p.m., Clancy searches for kids' Miralax on her cell phone, then take out 3V, which is, I guess, a, a food place. 
Afterwards, she uses Apple Maps to determine the time it would take to drive from the family's home in Duxbury to 3V, a restaurant in Plymouth, which I guess that would suggest that some sort of forethought and planning to uh, to get the husband away and she can be alone with the kids. At 4.47 p.m., Clancy calls a CVS in Kingston to ask if they have children's Miralax. The manager tells her they don't, but says they do have similar medications for children. At 4.53 p.m., Clancy texts her husband, who was working from home, his home, office in the basement, any chance you would want to do takeout from 3V. I didn't cook anything. It's been a long day. At 5.10, Lindsay calls uh, 3V to order takeout. She sends her husband out to pick up the medicine from CVS and fruit from 3V shortly after. So it's like she, to me, it seems like she's kind of putting in the time that she would need to kill her kids. You know what I'm saying? Doesn't mean she couldn't have had a mental lapse and still premeditated uh, in, in advance, I guess. And there was a really great video that I, I think you should check out. If you're interested in the story, I was listening to this guy, Dr. Todd Grant, and then listening to him made me think a little bit about the what the research out there is. And one of the things he mentioned is that postpartum psychosis occurs in approximately one out of two of every 1,000 deliveries. Uh, so it's like a rare thing, but it does happen. And the thing about this woman, and I'll continue with the timeline, is that she actually did try to get help. She was on a bunch of medications, but at the time of the murders, it was three. But throughout the months or that year, they had tried a bunch of different types of medications. She did check herself into a, a facility for help. So that could kind of, I guess, help her cause. And maybe with these types of situations where somebody murders somebody and it's mental health, obviously, I guess it has to be looked on a case by case situation, but also an overview for statistics and uh, research, I guess. All right. So she calls this restaurant to order takeout. And she sends her husband to pick up the medicine from CVS and from 3V shortly after. This was 5, 10 p.m. And these are the um, ping locations. So this is the home right here. This would be the CVS. And then down here would be the uh, 3V restaurant. And so 5.32 p.m., Patrick Clancy arrives at a CVS in Kingston. 5.33 p.m., Patrick Clancy calls his wife. She doesn't answer but calls him back one minute later and confirms which medication he should buy. He later tells investigators that his wife seemed like she was in the middle of something when they spoke, which is just so eerie that she could have maybe even been killing and strangling these kids while on the phone with him. 5.54 p.m., Patrick Clancy arrives at 3V, pays for their order, and leaves. 6.09 p.m., Patrick Clancy arrives home to silence and calls his wife. She doesn't answer. He goes upstairs to their bedroom to find the door locked. He's able to open the door and notices blood on the floor and an open window. He runs outside and sees his wife on the ground injured. He calls 911. During the 911 call, he can be heard asking his wife, where are the kids? He later tells police that she replied in the basement. At 6.11 p.m., Duxbury Police dispatch radios all cruisers to respond to 47 Summer Street for an attempted unaliving involving a woman who reportedly cut herself and jumped out of a second story window. Officers arrive to find Lindsay Clancy breathing and semi-conscious. Her cuts are no longer bleeding. Patrick Clancy is with her. At first, responders assess his wife. Patrick Clancy enters the home to check on his children. Soon, officers hear loud screaming coming from the house. When officers arrive in the basement, Patrick Clancy reportedly yells to kill the kids. Cora and eight-month-old Callan are found on the floor in a den area of the basement. Dawson is alone on the floor of his father's office. Dude, I mean, come on. Patrick later tells investigators that all three children had workout bands tied around their necks when he found them. And when we were watching that Twitch uh, stream, when we were talking about the, we saw some of the, the, uh, the hearing or the prosecutors or the attorneys talking, they talked about how long it would take to kill somebody with that workout band around their neck. Like, I don't know, I think they said three or five minutes. Like just, I mean, it's very... I mean, it takes time to do that. Lindsay is initially taken to South Shore Hospital in Weymouth with several broken bones in her back and rib cage injuries that have left her paralyzed below the waist. Her attorney later tells the court her children are sent to Beth Israel uh, Decones Hospital in Plymouth. The youngest 
Callan is later med flighted to Boston Children's Hospital. Approximately 7.28, Cora and Dawson are pronounced dead. At 7.29 p.m., a Massachusetts State Police trooper arrives at Beth Israel, where he speaks with several doctors who treated the Clancy children. A doctor who tended to Callan before he was med flighted describes the infant's condition as critical. Callan dies from his injuries three days later at the Boston Children's Hospital on January 27th. Well, so this is Patrick Clancy for Lindsay. Uh, it's over a million dollars, right? And it says, on behalf of the extended family, Clancy family, we invite you to offer support for Patrick as he navigates an unimaginable tragedy. We appreciate your thoughts, prayers, and outreach in support. This GoFundMe is intended to help Pat pay for medical bills, funeral services, and legal help. Uh, the assistance is especially needed because Pat will be unable to work for the foreseeable future as he weathers this painful, life-altering tragedy. Now, there was an article because it's, it's coming, people were kind of wondering, and it's coming to question, this GoFundMe situation. And so they're stating it was clarified that it's not being used for legal fees of the crime. It says here, a lawyer for Lindsay, a Massachusetts mother accused of strangling her children while she says she was experiencing extreme postpartum psychosis, has confirmed that more than one million raised through GoFundMe campaign will not be used to cover legal fees. And thousands, and my thought behind why. Because I've seen people on the internet talking, why this one, why not others, like so much support or GoFundMe's or whatever. And I, I guess because there's so many, I guess, women maybe or mothers or people that work in the medical field, maybe that can relate to the postpartum depression, psychosis. And maybe it's kind of, it's kind of like for a cause. Um, and, and like I said, and we'll talk a little bit more about it to the whole Andrea Yates, which I've never covered. Maybe I'll look into it. Maybe I'll look into Lindsay more. But, you know. There's been a, a rise in attention for this whole postpartum psychosis. And, and this is Andrea Yates, okay? This is the woman that drowned her five kids. And it says here, disturbing link between Lindsay and Andrea Yates, strikingly similar, murder mom drowned five kids in bathtub. So with Lindsay, she had strangled her kids, okay? And they said that she was overly medicated on a bunch of medication and like a zombie-like state. Miss Clancy, a labor and nurse... A labor and delivery nurse, and that's the other thing, because a lot of these labor and delivery nurses, these nurses in the field, they know exactly. They see these mothers all the time, you know, having babies and people, moms that are going through depression. Maybe there's a, a lot of support because of that as well. That she was a nurse um, at the Massachusetts General Hospital had taken sick leave to treat her condition after allegedly killing two of her children and fatally injuring a third on January 24th. She jumped out of a second story window. So the charges that Lindsay has is she was charged with two counts of murder, three counts of strangulation or suffocation and three counts of assault and battery with a dangerous weapon. And so like there's been talks. It's just, I guess this is kind of controversial. Uh, so there's an article here. It says, is it a crime to charge Lindsay with the crime of killing her three children? Advocates for a woman who suffer postpartum mood disorder are helping Kevin Reddington Clancy's defense lawyer make that case. And I mean, the prosecution is their job. They, they have to do this. Right? They can't just not, not prosecute, I guess. Right. Um, or, or is there's there near to be something in place? There's the whole conversation of like where these people just go to a mental facility, but then again, for how long do you let them back out? And so it says here also that Melissa an OGBYN nurse and a perinatal mental health advocate told the globe, the rhetoric from the prosecution and others in authority distort the medical complexity of this disorder. This article, I'm not going to read the whole thing because we're already pretty far into this video. And um, but they're, they're making because I guess the, I guess the prosecution's facing some criticisms or they're saying that this woman shouldn't be charged. Um, and so one part here says that, you know, the attorney, Tim Cruz, Timothy Cruz is doing his job and would, in fact, be abdicating the responsibilities of his office he if he didn't pursue criminal charges against the Duxbury mother these three children were horrifically murdered for Tim Cruz to say okay it's reported in the news that the defendant is suffering from postpartum depression I'm not going to charge her with murder that would be malpractice on his part his responsibility is to the three children and to the public it's the duty of the prosecutor to represent the interests of justice and the state this case needs to be tried in public, not behind closed doors or in the court of public opinion. The other thing with this article, and then we'll briefly touch on Andrea, with that harsh bagger, a liberal Democrat alludes to the politics lurking in the background, Cruz is a Republican DA in a blue state. He also successfully prosecuted 
uh, Latarsha Sanders, a Brockton woman, for killing her two sons with a knife, with a kitchen knife in 2018. Her family said she was psychotic and delusional, but Sanders, who was black, was convicted on first degree murder charges and last December was sentenced to life. So let's touch on Andrea Yates just briefly. Um, it, and it coincides a little bit because her ex husband had spoken about this Lindsay case and he's saying that she, Lindsay, shouldn't be charged and asking for people to forgive. And so nearly 21 years ago, Andrea horrified the nation when she confessed to drowning her five young children in the bathtub of her suburban Houston home on June 20th, 2001. Yates, who was 37 years old at the time, suffered from severe postpartum depression, postpartum psychosis, and schizophrenia. According to the court testimony, she waited for her husband, Rusty, to go to work. When he was gone, she began to drown her children one by one. Wow. After she drowned the children, she called 911 repeatedly and then called her husband and told him to come home from work. Yates was charged with five counts of capital murder. Her profile, her high profile 2002 trial made national news, it was broadcast live and even landed on the cover of People. A 2002 jury convicted her of capital murder, but sentenced her to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 40 years. Yates' attorney successfully appealed the case and the verdict was overturned after a 2006 retrial. Yates was found not guilty by reason of insanity, and I believe to this day she's in a, a mental facility. Yeah, the uh, Curryville State Hospital. You guys comment down below. Let me know your thoughts about these situations and how it should be dealt with. If you want to go on a one by one, uh, leave me a comment on the actual video. If you're in the live chat when it's over, comment in the video. And for each person, Julissa Thalmer, is this appropriate? She, I mean, she said she heard voices. I don't know if she was ever diagnosed for anything. The mother that shot her child with a shotgun nine times. And then Clancy, how do you feel about Clancy? Should she be just in a mental facility? Should she be charged? And then also, I mean, Andrea Yates was charged initially, but then it was appealed and found not guilty. Now she just remains in a mental facility. But then we have this other woman that was charged capital murder and in life for prison. And it seems like there's these different, and, I, and I'm sure I know case by case, you know, the thing with Lindsay and I haven't deep dove it. I just kind of just scrimmed the surface, but you know, she has all these journals too of her difficulties with the medications that she was taking. She did admit herself. I think it was for a couple of days. She did tell her husband that she had these thoughts of killing her children, which is crazy, you know, and then you have Andrea Yates, which I haven't even looked into at all. Drowning her kids one by one. So thank you guys so much for watching. Please hit the like button, subscribe, turn on the bell notifications. Check out Data Seal, a service that I use to protect myself. Uh, scrub my information from the internet. Click the link that I provided. Save 5% off. Check out the free scan. And yeah, take care. Peace.